What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the NIO Show. I'm Adam. That's Tate. I'll tell you one thing for dang sure. Steven's not here. Sean's not here. This is why you have a deep, deep roster uh, of all-stars, right? I mean, I, I feel like whenever we record around here, we're just picking like an all-star game roster. Just somebody's, somebody's out, somebody else's taps in, and we never miss a beat. What's going on, Tate? How are you? I'm good. I'm always ready in the bullpen. Always loose, always ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> the pitching analogies. How, how often? I mean, obviously, you know, you pitched at Corpus Christi, and then you were overseas in the minors. How how often in your regular life do you use pitching analogies? That's what I want to know. Too much to where I'll, I'll see where I can lose people in a conversation <laughs> when I start getting like too into the nitty nitty gritty of it, and then you I just, lose people. <laughs> just Megan just rolls her eyes at you. She's like, "Oh, geez, yeah, go again." And yeah, yeah. Megan was no slouch either. She played soccer at Corpus Christi, right? Yep. She's a D1 soccer player. She uh, she was pretty good in her own right. And she's tried to teach me a lot about soccer, but I'm, I don't have the cardio for that. <laughs> it yeah, is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it is. It is a different game. I, you know, played soccer a lot growing up, played volleyball in college. Volleyball, you really only move three to 12 feet at the most. You know, I was libero, so. After after the volleyball career kicked off, the soccer cardio went away real real quick. Didn't have the lungs yeah. anymore. Pitching, I was great. The fast twitch, I can I can go like great for maybe like you know two to three seconds, and then I'll just repeat that a hundred times throughout a day. But yeah. yeah, you're like I'm good. I'm good after that. That's why I well, go to my spin classes at Lifetime now. I'm trying to get in into shape. There you go. I love it. Spin spin. I my hips are already too tight. To, to cycle it just that uh, doesn't fit yeah. with me I, I get off and i just look like i'm still in the still in cycling <laughs> position well we are deep into february um we're a third of the way through uh it, it feels like spring is just absolutely tearing towards us i always tell people you know we live in chicago you're in frisco but dallas ish um i always tell people how to get through the winter here in chicago it's like, all right, you got to think about it. Nothing counts up to the holidays, right? Because that's exciting. That's fun. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got the romanticism, celebration of New Year. January is rough. Uh, it's a long month. It's a gray month. You just got to, if you can get a little weekend away, you know, save your trips until January. Get a weekend away. It was nice. We were in Vegas. Um, February. You know, you've got Valentine's Day. So if you have a significant other, you know, you've got something to look forward to. If you don't, maybe you take a little, you know, a little, a little, uh, a self vacation, uh, a little reprieve for uh, your own sanity. By the time you hit March, you're looking forward to St. Patrick's Day. That's basically spring. And we're through winter. We move on to the, to the rest. So um, we're yeah. a week, we're a week away from, from Valentine's Day. We're basically through it. Any, any fun plans for you guys for Valentine's Day? No spoiler so alerts if it's a surprise. Yeah, no, our, our anniversary is on the seventeenth, so I that was a very yeah. strategic, de very strategic decision uh, by us. So that way we could, you know, go ahead and just skip Valentine's Day for the rest of forever and just like wrap that into like, oh, it's our anniversary. So, <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a smart move, right? You double up. Yep. Um, you're able to, you know, to make sure that you never forget to celebrate Valentine's day or your anniversary, which is clutch. Uh, my parents' anniversary is on Valentine's day as well. So yeah. And it worked out beautifully for the actual wedding. Cause we got married on presence day weekend, gave everyone a free three day weekend to travel. So ta-da. You guys got it sorted out, man. Speaking of travel, you guys were, or not you guys, you were in Orlando, uh, last mm -hmm. Friday, uh, pro bowl was going on this weekend. You were out there for the players health NIL summit. Um, hosted by the one and only go-to content creator for college athletes, Sam Green. Um, how was the trip? How was the event? It was awesome. It was, you know, kind of a, a last minute thing, obviously, but man, they did a great job pulling off and putting on an event in like a short notice like that. Um, had all the, you know, a lot of the major power players in the industry there. Uh, what I thought was really cool about this was, this was really the first conference event um, summit symposium, whatever you know name you <laughs> want to give it, that really involved the collectives. So what also coincided with this was the TCA meetings, the TCA being uh, the collective association, which is formed of essentially the top 30 collectives around the country. 
So most, you know, a lot of your power five, but then they've got, you know, your, you know, some of your bigger, you know, big East collective. So those that are the most professionally run vetted um, with good representation and are really doing things, you know, large in part, you know, the right way. Um, what they did is they formed a union, formed an association to give collectives a voice in whatever the future of college athletics is. So you've probably seen this on display if you've been following some of the NIL hearings in Congress. So Walker Jones, who's the head of the Grove Collective at Ole Miss, um, I know he's testified in front of Congress at those hearings. He was there this weekend. Um, and what I thought was really great about that was collectives get such a, and I spoke about this on my panel down there, they get just such the easy scapegoat route of, oh, that's what's wrong with NIL. And really what they did a great job was advocating for, for themselves this past weekend. And like they've done in past hearings is that, you know, if you look into it, the best collectives are the ones that are a set up to, you know, stick around for whatever this next model is going to look like in some shape or form. Is it going to look different? Probably, but I forget who it was, but they went into like the typical, you know, day in the life of a collective operator. And it was, you know, taking a guy to the DMV to get his license, you know, helping guys set up insurance, um, helping guys book flights for their families to come in to town. So it's so much more of the day to day helping these athletes. Well, than and, and what people like think. that, that's kind of, I, I think back to, I don't know what your experience is like, but I think back to my experience, like a lot of that stuff was, done by coaching staff um mm -hmm. or by like university help you know i grew up in chicago played in california like i had no family around i didn't know anybody when i went into school and so that those little things like hey i need a i need to update my driver's license like and yeah. i don't have a car so how do i get there a lot of that stuff turns into some of those other duties as assigned by coaches yeah. that are like all right man like i'll, I'll take you here we'll hop in the car with my kids like don't worry about it like you're mm -hmm. kind of relying on a lot of the goodwill of athletics departments and coaches, which that's why they're there. But to have somebody or to have an organization um, that maybe has a bit more capacity or time um, yeah. to do that when they're not trying to also break down film and get on the road to recruit and all that kind of stuff is is great. So how would you yeah. how would you define we, we talked about a couple things there. You mentioned a, a hot topic we'll talk about today. Uh, union. Um mm -hmm. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Some exciting news. You said another thing, some of the best collectives in the country. H how would you define, you know, from all of your experience, Talkwalker, uh, Director of NL Strategy at Kansas, like now here kind of helping us run our collective program. How would you define a best collective? Is it biggest? Is it like, hey, I'm the collective at Alabama. That means I'm the best. Um, what, what, what are the criteria to be a best collective? Um, great question. Uh, I think a lot of people are still trying to figure that out. But in my opinion, I think the if you had to give an award, if we had the Grammys for best NIL collective, I think one of the main things you would want to look at is how diversified, you know, are their revenue streams? Hmm. Meaning, are they just reliant on, you know, your major three or four donors, right, who are writing these major checks, and then like, that's it. And don't get me wrong, you need those three or four donors sure. you know, to really step up. However, see, you know, following the landscape, following, you know, everything that's going on in the legal world right now around NIL, a lot of schools are actively trying to pull collectives more in under their realm. So what collectives need to be doing and the best ones are doing is diversifying their revenue streams, whether that's through really putting in, you know, more emphasis on brand deals and almost essentially serving as an agency, a marketing agency for these athletes. So yeah. that's one. Number two would be around growing your membership. That's what, where we get into, you know, that's sustainable. You know what that income looks like every month coming in. You're providing value to members. Um, and then three, I would look at ways like, what are you doing to get creative in the space? So like there's all, you know, a million different ways people are looking at you know, how do we get creative? How do we find a new revenue stream that hasn't been tapped into? You know, shameless plug, our collective programs kind of served as a great option for some well. of that. <laughs> um, it, you know, it's really worked out as a great option. That's a lot of the feedback that we've obviously gotten is, hey, we don't really have to do anything for this. We just, it's an opportunity that already exists for our athletes. 
now we just get to tie into the NIL ecosystem even deeper. So yeah. those are really the three ways I look at that is how are you, you know, setting yourself up so that you don't have to rely on just two or three donors. Yeah. And it's one of those, those things like we'll talk about this with the NLRB rulings, but what you hear a lot in the news and the conversation that's happening, like we'll call it in the, in the cultural zeitgeist of just, or the echo chamber of X or Twitter or whatever you want to say is like collectives, rah, rah, like you said, they're the, they're the scapegoat. When, when you really take a step back and look at what are we trying to do and how are we trying to function um, in, in the current ecosystem, you need an organization like a well-run collective. I'm not saying like, I'm not, I'm not using the blanket term collective. I'm saying like a well-run collective, one that, that you just described um, to, to help manage a lot of the chaos and, and, and help you keep some of the, let's be real competitive edge in how you're going to support this whole new ecosystem that's required to run a high quality competitive program. And, and yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't on purpose. It was a little bit of, uh, of an accident to have our collective program, uh, launched right before you went out there, but, um, worked out great. I'm sure you had some great conversations. I know we've, mm -hmm chatted a little bit offline, uh, more big things to come. But, you know, our collective program is basically saying, look, we know how to activate merchandise at an institution, right? We have the community, we have the audience. We know we're going to pay the kids really well. We know how to do this. You know how to manage members and do your thing and, you know, be boots on the ground, connect with the athletes, bring value to them in that way. Um, a lot of them are looking for those merchandising solutions like, oh, I, you know, I, I got to have a T-shirt for sale. But that doesn't necessarily resonate with fans outside of the fans who are smart enough to really understand, like, I don't really want this shirt, but yeah. I, I got to get the shirt to, you know, to help support whatever. So um, what we're able to do is, you know, with some of our other great partners like Original Retro Brand is provide merchandising solutions for these collectives that will create some revenue for them, but still be licensed by the school. And let's just call it what it is. Give something fans that they actually, or give something to the fans that they actually want to wear, right? They, they actually want to wear the school marks. They actually want to celebrate um, the institution. So how can we provide that type of merchandise while still creating some sort of sustainable um, or incremental revenue stream for, for the collectives and not have them having to like try to run merch lines uh, <laughs> while they're yeah. also yeah. volunteers. Yeah, it, it's an area that I, I've learned a lot more about the merchandise and licensing world since I came in here than I ever thought I would know in my career. But it's an area that takes up a lot of, for a collective, it takes up a lot of time. It's not an easy thing to run to figure out who's my supplier, who's my distributor, what are the margins on this, who's fulfilling the orders. Um, and so when they get presented with the opportunity of somebody that knows the NIL space like we do to kind of essentially take that off their hands. But hey, also, we're going to do some uh, some unique stuff that no one else can do, i.e. our retro brand partnership. Um, it, it opens up a lot of different doors for them and really just makes their lives easier. So we're already seeing this, like, you know, a couple of these collectives that have come in kind of under our fold are incredible partners they're an extension of the school in the sense that they are talking with the players they're talking with the guys and then sending those feedback and messages ideas like we have one of our acc collectives who's you know texting our account manager for that school being like hey he really likes this shirt really likes this design can we do this one a little different like they've now turned into an extension of the school and that's exactly what you want a well-run collective to be right yeah 100 percent well, let's let's shift gears here a little bit because there's some uh, really exciting. If you've if you have the internet, <laughs> I'm sure you've seen. Uh, well, I guess have the internet and care about college sports at all. I'm sure you've seen the the landmark ruling by the NLRB National Labor National Labor and Relations Board. Uh, it came out yesterday afternoon. A um, little quick background: uh, Dartmouth men's basketball program. Uh, filed a petition to be able to unionize. And this has been a little bit on ice until they could get a hearing but from the NLRB. I think this was back in October. You'll have to fact check me on that. Um, but the ruling, the hearing and the ruling kind of finally came out um, yesterday. And for the first time ever, the uh, NLRB ruled in favor of the student athletes, granting them a petition uh, to hold elections to form a union. And we have to give a, a big shout out to 
uh, Jesse Doggerty from the Washington Post, who covered this really well. Um, uh, Sportico has covered this really well. Amanda Kristovich from Front Office Sports has, has covered this really well. So um, please feel free to go and, and read those articles. They, they break it down um, really, really well, uh, all the way from, you know, this isn't the first time uh, a school has done this. We'll touch a little bit on Northwestern. But um, from just just off the cuff, Tate, we'll, we'll dive into the weeds here. But a school's athletes forming a union, good or bad? Good. Uh, and, you know, I always look at anything involving, especially in this industry where athletes have been, you know, their rights have been, you know, silenced and stripped from them for a long time. I look at any step towards, you know, more athlete empowerment as a good thing. So that's my initial off the cuff one yeah. word. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. Shocker. You and I think very similarly about a lot of things, um, which, you know, typically you want some dissenting opinions on a podcast. But here we are. This one's not hard to uh, to get on the side of the student athletes for. Um, but hey, if, you, with, if you're if you don't agree with this one, you're probably not listening to a show called the NIL podcast or the NIL show as it is. Yeah, so. exactly. That's fair. Um, you know, the 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 kind of I don't know it, when when you turn the rock over, though. There are a lot of maybe unintended consequences that potentially mm -hmm. are uh, put on the table as a result of this. Um, and, and before we get there, let's let's go ahead and, and, and kind of dive into what's actually happening here. So, you know, the school, just because this ruling came out from the NLRB doesn't mean that, OK, it's done, um, done and dusted. Everything's over, of course. We live in America, the land of appeals. Um, there will be an appeal process from the school. This could essentially um, go all the way up to the Supreme Court, which is you know what happened with with the Austin case and things like that. So it's not unheard of. Number one, number two. Let's not forget that we're in an election year, um, mm -hmm. or, or we have an election uh, coming up here relatively soon. And usually, the political seats on the NLRB uh, mirror whoever the incumbent president is. So there's some changes that may or may not happen there. Biden is, you know, traditionally a very pro union um, president, which is reflected in, you know, who, who sits on the NLRB that may change may not. Um, but that has some factors here. Uh, but the biggest topic of conversation is this happened in 2015 Northwestern university football program, uh, those athletes petitioned the regional director in Chicago to form a union and they got denied pretty much on the basis of like, well, it's not really fair to allow one institution um, in, you know, this power five conference to unionize. And since the NLRB doesn't hold any jurisdiction over public schools like Ohio State, University of Michigan, Michigan State, they didn't have any jurisdiction to really level the playing field across the board. So they said, no, 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 you cannot unionize. That was back in 2015. What's different now in 2024, 2023, um, that really sets the table for this to have some, some serious momentum? In my head, so I, in 2015, I was a high school senior about to start my college career. So this is something I kept, you know, obviously an eye on. Um, what has changed so much, and I go back to my days when I was in SAC, right, and I would try to bring this conversation up, right? Mm -hmm. There was not a single, um, you know, thesis paper I wrote about that was not about <laughs> why college athletes deserve the rights, their name, image, and likeness. The first thing that's really changed, I think, is public opinion and public sway on, you know, athletes' rights, the NCAA as a whole, and how that model has structured. Um, I think that's the biggest thing that has really changed is the public opinion of that. Second is we've now seen that you know, contrary to what some people on X slash Twitter universe think that we're now coming up on year three of athletes having rights and being able to be paid. And guess what? The model still works just great. People are still watching at record numbers. People are still going to games at record numbers. They're buying jerseys, buying shirts. It's clear the product is not going anywhere. And athletes have now had their rights in a pretty unrestricted, unregulated market. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think those are the two things that have now gone to show that, hold on now, maybe this model is one that just didn't need to exist for a long time. And we're starting to see that, you know, reflected in countless legal cases that are going on right now is that's where it's shifting. 
Well, and that's, you know, that that's the, <clears throat> you can't look at any of these in a vacuum. And mm -hmm. I was talking to my dad about this. And, you know, now we know that uh, the, the TRO that was um, filed by Tennessee has been denied. Uh, but I was talking to my dad, who's um, a high school athletics director. And I was like, if you look <laughs> at all of the things that every day, it's like death by a thousand paper cuts, right? Like mm -hmm. you, you, this, this system that has been created um, may have been fine, uh, but the moment that it really started to get inflated beyond any reasonable numbers, that was the moment that, you know, from a leadership perspective, you should have said, hold on. Um, we're not even talking about like altruistic motives or anything like that, but just from a, I want this organization to last for a really long time. And if I just continue to uh, marginalize and bulldoze over probably the largest subset of stakeholders in my organization, eventually this will mm -hmm. become a problem. And that's what's happened over the last 10 years or so. The numbers have been so inflated from media rights and sponsorship deals and things like this that you start to, w when you fire coaches, and pay them millions of dollars to not work. And the running joke in college sports is the best job in the country is to be a fired football coach. You're going to yep. start to hear some questions about like, wait, how is there this much money in here? But we're still leaning on the fact that the kids don't deserve it. When the kids are 22 years old, 24 years old, graduate students. And so it's interesting to see like, antitrust lawsuit after antitrust lawsuit after antitrust lawsuit. And then you kind of have this second front where you're fighting on uh, now classification of employee or not. Um, we all know what happens when you try to fight a war on two fronts and you pretty much lose every time. Um, I don't think it's ever worked out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not not a good strategy. No. So that's why I think uh, Jay Billis, is, Jay Billis is one of the all time Twitter follows because he always jumps on those whenever there's a you know, twenty million dollar buyout, and he's like, "Remember, the NCAA just says there's not enough money to pay athletes." Like, yeah, and he's exactly right. The the second that, you know, back to your point, the second this thing started tipping is when we started having billion dollar TV contracts and multi multi million dollar coaches' salaries, while the actual labor, you know, received nothing you know, in terms of like a cash value. That's where this you know, was current model is destined to blow up and fail. And that's why I do think that groups like a, you know, like an AO, athletes.org, in this current landscape, they are vital and couldn't be more important to what is going on. Um, everything's shifting, everything's changing. And it seems like the group that has had the least, you know, amount of seat at the table, someone speaking on their behalf for a long time has been the athletes. And for, Jim Caval and his whole team to go over there and really take this mission on and do that. Um, I think they are going to be, or they already are, they're going to continue to flourish into, you know, the power player in the game um, when it comes to giving athletes a seat at the table. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's not an easy task, right? Because no. one, once we go down the path of employability, now we're bringing in federal legislation that governs not just college sports, but not, now it just governs employment law, right? And then yep. you're bringing in state law uh, that governs employment law. And I don't know if you've ever moved states or worked in other states, but not every state has the same laws and regulations. And so, you know, to, to expect even a single conference, right? The Big Ten, we're mm -hmm. from Southern California. I say we, because I'm, a, you know, a Michigan fan. Um, oops, I teach Northwestern. I mean, I'm a Northwestern fan. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're a conference that spans from, from Oregon down to Southern mm -hmm. California, all the way across to, you know, Pennsylvania and New Jersey in Rutgers. So like there's this incredible variance in how conferences, institutions, and even the, the student athletes themselves, if they're going to be transferring or trying to pick where to go to school and be categorized as an employer, You've mm -hmm. got to have an organization that understands the nuances of that, can help you navigate it, but more importantly, can advocate for you at that broader level of saying, hey, this is unreasonably complicated. Let's come to a solution of how we want to treat this entire group um, uniformly, fairly, hopefully reasonably, 
Um, but but more importantly, with with some some protection of their best interests at heart. Yeah. Because we've seen we can't trust the 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 current leadership to say we're not required to, but we're going to take care of you. They they just have shown that they're not going to do that. Everybody in the all stakeholders in this have had, you know, heavy heavy lobbying efforts for years, for decades, speaking on their behalf. And I say that everybody except the athletes. And you can point to why it's so hard. It's a revolving door of athletes in and out in three, four years. That's why there's yet to be, you know, for a couple of reasons, there's yet to be the one that's stepped forward and been successful. Now, what you have, though, for the first time is a group that is being run like this by experts in the actual field, in the industry, who have been day to day on college campuses, speaking with athletes, working with athletes, even pre NIL. And then now in the current NIL era, that's why I believe that AO is going to be the one that is destined um, to change this for college athletes. Yeah, I, I, I love what you said. Um, <clears throat> because it is a very, it's almost like a knee jerk, like default reaction. It's like, oh, well, this is just a revolving door of, you mm -hmm. know, every four years, we get new, how are we supposed to do you know what the average career is for an NFL player? About three, isn't it? It's like three to five. Yeah. 3.3 3 years. Yep. 3.3 yep. 3 years. So we could figure out at the NFL of saying, whoa, 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 we have to collectively bargain. We have to put some guardrails in here. We have to make sure that we have some standards and you get them for 0. 0.7 years less than you get college students. Yep. So um, it's and just kind of on that same. Yeah. And on that same boat, you know, we keep hearing at Rick Patino. I don't know if you saw his tweet yesterday but he had one of those were like man and i've heard this from countless coaches that hey why don't we just his tweet basically said the big e should just set a two million dollar salary cap for every school and the con and the conference should yeah just sign the athlete and you know i was like yeah i'm with you like sure that can't happen without collective bargaining though so exactly countless coaches have said why don't we just set a salary cap and just, this could all be so simple i'm like you're you're on the right track. However, that can't happen in the antitrust model without collective bargaining. So there has to be a group that steps up yeah. and can fill that void. And I think and, that's one of the biggest frustrations for coaches is they think it should all be so simple, but no, there has to be a legal model here. Well, and and, and to to sit on the side of the coaches, it is that simple. It, like yeah. it is that simple. And most of these coaches are coming from, you know, Rick Pitino is coming from the NBA. Jim Harbaugh is coming from the NFL. Like these coaches mm -hmm. are going, guys, yep. we know how this works. Just get it done. But to your point, like to get it done, you have to have a CBA. So stop fighting that piece of it, embrace it. And we can all move on with a sustainable model that works for everybody um, in theory. Uh, yep. Now, <laughs> the, these are these are some of the. Uh, some of the, you know, I mentioned when you turn over a rock and you've got all those grubs and beetles and, and all that, that stuff, you don't see it first. Um, I, I'll, I'll just be honest. Some of my concerns are Olympic sports. This mm -hmm. is not new. I'm not like the only person to, you know, cry fire on this, but we don't, we haven't done a good job in this country of creating a, a good model for Olympic feet, Olympic ODPs, Olympic development programs, right? Or, or, or feeder programs into Olympic sports. And you may think like, who cares? Olympic sports don't matter. Um, that doesn't generate money. That doesn't whatever. And to that, I would say, well, you just don't understand the sport ecosystem then. Um, mm -hmm. but it, it still is a massive industry. Um, but that's, that's kind of one of my, like, whoa, uh -oh, I still think we should go this direction. But a little bit of a whoa -oh in terms of just Olympic competition, elite competition, number one. But number two, Olympic sports are oftentimes a path to education mm -hmm. for uh, a, a lot of underprivileged or underserved communities for a number of reasons. One, um, they're often individual sports, which means there's a really low barrier of entry to you know train and compete and, and get better. You don't have to buy a lot of equipment. But um, number two, if you know, like, hey, I'm not going to be a nine time pro bowler, um, so I'm not going to go play football. But that means that there's not a path to the pros for you. So you have to get an education while playing a sport so that you can hopefully get some scholarship and help offset some of those costs. 
but you can't play a sport. You know this, I know this, where, you know, your coaches or the registrar are coming to you saying like, no, 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 you actually have to go study <laughs> early childhood education. You can't mm -hmm. study organic chemistry because your sports schedule won't allow you to make the labs and things like that. And when you look at a lot of the earning potential of, you know, some of these degrees that are, uh, we'll call them green check marks for these revenue generating sports versus the degrees that a lot of the Olympic sports go into, the earning potential is, is pretty lopsided, right? And of course there are edge cases, but you start to see some of these unintended consequences where we say, oh, if we turn all of our Olympic sports into club sports and we don't allow them to have scholarships, all of a sudden we're putting a little bit more of a ceiling on degree completion, on ability to get degrees that that map to high earning careers. Like there's these other unintended consequences that happen. What what are your thoughts on on kind of that fallout? I mean, I couldn't, there's literally not one point on it I would dissent on. Um, you Shocker. can consider, you, you can consider baseball and Olympic sport. Technically we're in the Olympics like half the time, but um, for all intents and purposes in college athletics, baseball is considered a Olympic sport, right? It's not in that, not it's in the non-rev generating sport. My wife, you mentioned earlier, Megan was a soccer player. So coming at it from that lens, that you're spot on. I played with countless teammates that would not have gone to college if it were not for, you know, the ability to play college baseball. And another important piece that I think is also people don't get this for the large part unless you've worked or been in the like inner dwellings of college athletics is the amount of money that, you know, Olympic sport athletes actually pay the school in terms of not a lot of them are on full scholarships. Mm -hmm. You look at the amount of tuition that is being paid by those students to go to that school. And a lot of those are, okay, well, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't go to that school. Like there's a lot of student athletes who mm, I'm not going to go to Texas A&M Corpus Christi, you know, as a regular student or to play club sports, if I'm not getting a chance to play, you know, an NCAA certified sport. Mm -hmm. Well, great. You might've just lost out on, you know, hundred thousand dollars plus in tuition there for the university so that's another angle to look at it from and then we don't have to go too deep into this but on that same you know impetus i also look at this from the mid-major side we both played at mid-major institutions like mid-major schools are entirely different worlds galaxies universes of you know the power three power four conferences now and it falls the same thing with football men's and women's basketball as it does to your Olympic sports. Yeah. And, you know, I think we, we talk about this a lot. I've said this a lot to our team. Uh, I had this story told to me a while ago as it relates to, to leadership. I can't remember um, who first shared it with me, but we're in a little bit of a situation where, you know, you're marching through a field with a group behind you and you're the leader and you come up to a fence in that field. And there's really two types of leaders, right? The first type of leader says, hurry up, tear this fence down so we can keep going. And the second type of leader says, hurry up, figure out why this fence is here so we can keep going. And I, I would hope that most of us, I would hope that most of the leaders that are <laughs> in college sports right now would, would lean more towards that second type of leader. It's not that you won't tear the fence down. That, that may be the conclusion that you come to. Hey, we got to tear this down as fast as we can. But until you figure out why things are there, you really mm -hmm. don't know what's on the other side of that fence. Maybe it's a bull with some pretty sharp horns that are going to be coming at you, right? Um, so, you know, we we are 100% on the right path, in my opinion, of, of changing mm -hmm. and reshaping this model. You know, Charlie Baker's put out his proposal about different divisions and voluntary um, uh, participation in those divisions, and I think that's great. But I, I do think maybe this is a, you know, an advocacy for the model wasn't the right model in the first place. If, if we just continue barreling down the path of light it all on fire, burn it to the ground, there's going to be some pretty significant fallout um, that I, I'm not 100% sure has reached or, or bubbled to the top of the conversation that, you know, fans on either side um of the conversation have really considered all the way down to the ground level of this you know billion dollar industry that we've created so it's it's going to be a, a very interesting next i don't know six months 36 months but what what happens from here obviously there's appeals what do you see um 
uh, kind of, if you look into your crystal ball, what do you see kind of happening from here? Well, you know, obviously what's going to happen in the courts is going to happen in the courts, right? So I think it's, so we'd wise. be, yeah, we'd be wasting a lot of our breath if we tried to, you know, at least myself, pretend like I was a lawyer and look deep into what I do is I, I, I lean on my lawyer friends, AKA Mitt Winter. <laughs> shout, to explain, shout out Winter Sports Law. <laughs> to explain it to me what's going on. Um, but what I do think will happen is, you know, not to climb back into this boat, but what I see is the biggest change that people can keep an eye on is on the athlete empowerment side. Yep. Um, i.e. again, AO and the moves that groups like them are going to continue to make for publicly advocating for athletes, but also, you know, a lot of the stuff that happens behind closed doors that people may not see and speaking on behalf of those athletes. Um, I think that's what's going to be really important because we've had these conversations for years, for decades. The one missing piece is there hasn't been somebody with credibility and legitimacy speaking for the athletes. Now, really for the first time, there's still a brand new group, right? That, you know, yeah. for the first time, we have that. And I think that is going to be a major driver in a lot of these conversations because, you know, there's a lot of power that is resting, you know, with that group right now and with athletes in general. Um, how they use that is going to be really interesting to me um, to shape up the next one to three years. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um Speaking of Mitt, you know, he said there's really two paths forward here um, mm -hmm. to get into a little bit more of the nuances of this NLRB ruling. You know, they, they basically set a precedent saying the control that the institution exercises over its student athletes is enough to classify it as an employee employer relationship. And we're talking about, mm -hmm. you know, goods in exchange for services. Sometimes that's scholarship. Sometimes that's access to resources that could be monetized in terms yep. of, you know, how we're talking about this. I, I mean, I haven't played, it's 2024, I haven't played in 15 years and I was cleaning out a closet and found boxes of shoes that I've never even worn. Um, so, you know, exchange of, of goods, um, uh, access to things like sports psychology and special meal times and things like that. So um, there is a world where now all of a sudden you have to get taxed on those things. Uh, mm -hmm. But that level of control um, is really kind of what we're, we're hinging this decision on. So uh, Mitt talked about really kind of seeing two paths forward. The first being you, you got to collectively bargain. Like that's it, that that's, that's the option. Or you have to be willing to significantly reduce the amount of control that you exercise over student athletes and those and that one will never happen <laughs> <laughs> yes and so essentially what you know how i interpret that is we're on a path of basically um you know two worlds colliding where the amateur uh goes away we have essentially elite professional collegiate sports and you have club sports and, and, and that, like, that is it. That's, that's the main difference between club sports and, and NCAA sponsored sports is the amount of control that you have over the student athletes. So it is going to be a, a very, very interesting six to 36 months. Um, I would implore people who, uh, like to flutter their fingers on Twitter, um, just remember, there's a lot going on behind the scenes. There's a lot of additional considerations. Things move slow. So before you shout at a 19-year-old kid about what an idiot he is for wanting to you know, pursue employability, take a beat, maybe, and think about, <laughs> hey, what are some other considerations here? So um, as that or as remember always, that, yeah, that or remember that, hey, if you got offered, you know, 10% raise to leave your current job, you just might do it. You so, just or, might take it. Always, always keep that in mind. Well, uh, with that, once again, here we are living in unprecedented times. Um, this is our, our ninth once in a lifetime <laughs> event that's happened in the last three years as it relates to college sports. Who knows what will happen? Uh, you and I are just two guys here shouting into the void. Um, but uh, it's been a lot of fun doing it. I hope you've had a lot of fun listening to it. Um, we will see you next week. This has been another episode of the NIL Show. I'm Adam. There's Tate. We'll be back next week with some more people, some more thoughts. We'll talk to you soon.